Uh, one of the features of our worship uh, service is the time that we give to prayer. Lots of prayer. We have an opening prayer, and at times a closing prayer. Then we have several prayers during the communion. And then there are times we offer prayers to bless newborns, new babies, new families. And then special prayers for people who respond to the invitation at the end of the service. We have a prayer for them. And then there are the blue cards. Marty just did the blue cards. Prayer requests from individuals that are honored um, by one of our different elder each month. Uh, so there's lots of, you know, if someone says, what do you do most at worship? Pray. You know, more minutes go into prayer during our worship time than almost any other uh, activity. And of course, this is in keeping with James' encouragement. What does he say? Is any one of you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him. James 5.14. So this is an important part of our service because we are, as a group, led in prayer for one of our number, and this draws us closer together in love and concern for one another in our sufferings. You know, the prayer time that we have, the blue cards. Of course, there's a downside to the blue cards as well, and that is the ever-growing list of sick and needy people that continue to require help. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a red letter day if there are no blue cards because that means, whoa, you know, no tragedy, no illness, no accidents among our number worthy of sending a card up. But most of the times there's always, always a blue card. Each week the elders read the names of those who have cancer in its many forms. Heart and other type of serious illnesses, tragedies suffered from accidents, the many problems that a that accompany advanced age. People have to be you know, moved to a different type of location to accommodate their, uh, their problems, their weaknesses. And, and of course, you know, saddest of all, we have to announce the passing of uh, members, the dying of members, the death of family members. So it's not, you know, it's not good news. Sometimes you know, it gets depressing because it's, it never ends. <laughs> it never ends. Every week, you know, new sorrows new burdens. And to make matters worse, many times the prayers are for Christians. They're for good people who have obeyed, who serve the Lord all of their lives. And when you see how they suffer, sometimes it makes you wonder, why should righteous people have to suffer? You know, we believe in Christ, we serve Him, we want to be with Him, we want to do what He wants us to do. You know, God could eliminate all of our suffering if He chose to, but He doesn't. He doesn't do it. Why? So today I, I'd like to share with you a couple of reasons why I believe that God lets us suffer, lets the righteous suffer. Before I give these, however, I want us to understand that a major reason why suffering is such a challenge to people's faith is because we automatically think that suffering is a bad thing. You know, we say suffering's a bad thing. Why does this bad thing happen to good people, to righteous people, to faithful people? You know, suffering from illness and accidents, family problems, grieving, all of this is painful and difficult, but you know what? Not necessarily bad. In other words, bad things may happen to us that cause us pain, but the pain itself is not necessarily a bad thing. And here's why. First of all, suffering motivates us. It's a motivator. There's no greater motivating force than pain and suffering. We're motivated to change behavior that may have led to our suffering. We're motivated to prioritize our lives. When suffering, we usually see more clearly what is important and what is not. You know, the person who gotten a, a report of cancer and they're terminal, they've got three months to live, they're not looking for sales you know, to buy Christmas gifts for next Christmas. Suffering, death, 
Boy, it sure brings life into crystal clear focus. Suffering motivates us to think about our mortality and how fragile we are and seek out the answers to the question of, well, what happens after I die? I go my whole life thinking, oh, I had death, so far away, so far away, so far away. <laughs> Bang, then it happens. Maybe not to us right away, but it happens to somebody right next to us. People are most shocked when they say, I just talked to him yesterday, he was here, we were talking, he was fine, we, we chit-chatted, we even laughed about stuff. You're telling me he died? Yeah, when he went home, he just sat in the chair, had a heart attack and died. Wow. If it weren't for suffering, for example, Job in the Bible would not have been motivated to ask the questions that he asked and found the answers to. It's suffering that motivates most people to search for God, search for His will, search for His presence in their lives. When we're having a good time and everything's just rocking along, we never say, where are you God? No. <laughs> it's when we've been struck down and when we're in our bed and we can't get out of that bed for whatever reason, hour after hour after hour, that we, our mind finally says, Lord, where are you? Why aren't you helping me? Without suffering, you see, we, we tend to stay in one dimension. We tend to think in the same terms from day to day. And so pain and suffering has a way to move us to look beyond ourselves for answers, for relief, for redemption. Another reason why God allows the righteous to suffer Suffering enables us to sympathize. Now when I say it allows us to sympathize, I don't simply mean it helps us to sympathize or understand what it's like to feel pain. I think we all know what pain is like. And pain, all by itself, doesn't really give us insight to anything. It just hurts. No, when I say sympathize, I mean the ability to understand how people continue to live their lives despite their suffering. For example, you know, I, like so many of you, we could start a club. You know, we could start a support group. You know, I've got back troubles, bad back troubles. 25 years now, I can remember. It all started, I was picking William up he bumped his head, he was just a little boy, five-ish something, he bumped his head and he was crying and he was on the floor and I walked over and said, come on, come to daddy, William, come on buddy, and I leaned over and picked him up and threw my back out. You know, you had that experience and I hit the ground and I, oh man, that hurt. You know, pain medicine, you know, uh, muscle relaxers, uh, anti-inflammatory exercise, you know, but boy, couldn't move, stiff. And so for 25 years, there's been two gears in my life. Gear number one, it hurts all the time. When I get up in the morning, it hurts. And when I go to bed at night, it hurts. That's gear number one. And then gear number two, it hurts a lot. <laughs> That's gear number two. It hurts a lot to the point where I can't get up out of the bed and I can't pick up something, and I can't do something. Now I'm not saying that you know, to share my medical history with you. That would be way too long. I'm saying that to say I suffer from something that so many of you suffer from, okay? When I talk about sympathizing, I mean that because of my own pain, I have gained a greater appreciation of how other people with much worse back problems than I, how those people live their lives without complaint, without pity for themselves. Men and women with difficult jobs in constant pain are doing their work or are faithful at church or have a sense of humor all while they continue to suffer with all kinds of chronic pain. I was able, because of my own small problem, 
to not simply sympathize with them, but to appreciate the effort and the maturity and the true spirituality of other people by seeing how they dealt with their suffering in such a positive way. I was also able to understand those who had fallen to discouragement and despair under the burden of their suffering because it's so easy to do when the pain never stops. When it's just, you know, it never stops. And I observe with wonder people who have way, way more issues and pain than I have ever had, and yet somehow they bear under, somehow they're able to smile, somehow they're able to get outside of themselves and ask how I'm doing. Imagine, people I've visited in the hospital spent more time talking to me about, so how's your back these days? Hey man, you're, you're all plugged up and you're near death, you're wondering how my back is? Jesus had to suffer pain in order to become our savior and our mediator, in order to truly sympathize and empathize with us. The Hebrew writer says, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, including pain, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest. For since he himself was tempted, in other words, tested, in that which he suffered, he is also to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews 2. In other words, Jesus knew pain because we know pain. Humanity finds its common denominator in suffering because everybody understands suffering. Regardless of race or religion, pain is pain. I remember, no matter what you think politically, okay, forget politics. I remember a, 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 you know, a news program that was showing you know, the problem of the, the people escaping the war in Syria, you know, the thousands and thousands that just got their suitcase and their kids in their arms. Imagine having two little babies and, and knowing that you have absolutely nowhere to go that that night you're going to sleep on the road or in the field somewhere, think about that. They have to go to the bathroom, they have to eat, they have to do something. And, 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 and one man was there holding his kid, you know, and, and the, the police were there stopping them from going forward, and, and the reporter was recording all of this, and the man looked at the cop and he said, I'm a human being. Don't you see, I'm like you, he said. I'm a human, I'm a person, I'm suffering. Well, what if it was you with your children here? And he was crying out to him to, so that the policeman would at least meet him on a human level. He's in pain. And he wanted the cop to understand his pain. You know, when our two oldest children, Paul and Julia, were in the military, I would pray for them but I would also pray for others who were in the military as well. And you know what? I would even pray for our adversaries in this world because I knew that they also had mothers and fathers who were praying for them. And they didn't want their children to be hurt or to suffer pain. You know, much good comes from suffering because it brings us closer and it helps us appreciate others who, like ourselves, share in the very human act of dealing with pain. And then, thirdly, I think God lets us suffer because suffering reveals the horror of sin. Of course, whenever someone suffers, especially as a result of sudden or tragic illness or accidents, the question that always comes up is why? And there are a variety of reasons that try to give suffering a happy ending, you know? You know, you're suffering because something good will eventually be produced out of it. But most of the times, you know, or many times, people blame God for their suffering. They're angry at Him for not stopping the suffering or they lay at His feet the blame for their sorrow as if He was the one that caused their pain. But the Bible clearly reveals that sin is the thing that causes all suffering and death, not God. 
Romans 6, 23. It began with Adam and Eve who disobeyed God and as a result caused the fall of not only the human race, but also as the sinfulness of man multiplied, the fall of the creation as well. And so man's fallen nature combined with a creation subject to disease and catastrophe has brought untold suffering on generation after generation of people in addition to the sure death that is inevitable for everyone. The saddest part of all of this is that there are so many who do not realize that sin was and continues to be the root cause of all suffering. For those enlightened by the gospel of Christ, suffering is a constant reminder of the horror and power of sin in this world. This understanding can produce a healthy revulsion and rejection for sinful things. Fire burns. Don't touch. And you get to hate sin when you've seen enough of the damage it's done. And this understanding also leads one to appreciate more and more the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf in order to remove our sins and consequently save us from the eternal suffering that we would have had to endure because of our own sinfulness. Without the linkage between sin and suffering, we might never come to know and obey the gospel of Christ. You see, a lot of people have obeyed the gospel because they do not want to suffer eternally. And the gospel warns us. Good news is you get eternal life. Bad news is you also get eternal suffering. And then one more, forgot, forgot about this one. God lets us suffer because suffering draws us closer to God, if we allow it to. You know, some people blame God for their pain, others draw closer to Him because of their pain. Paul the Apostle, who was already quite knowledgeable concerning God's word and His will, really drew nearer to God when he suffered, not when he studied. It was his pleadings with God to remove his thorn in the flesh that led him to hear the Lord say, my grace is sufficient for thee, 2 Corinthians 12, seven to nine. Paul wanted his strength and his vitality, he wanted it back. He wanted this thing that in interfered with his work to be taken away. Have you ever been there? Lord, take this thing away. You know I want to serve you. You know I want to do this for you. You know I want to do that for you. Don't you understand if you, if you allow me to be debilitated, I can't do these things for you? And then God responded by telling him that Paul's weakness and his greater dependence on him, you know what, that was good enough. Good enough. Good enough for God. I can really use you now that you're dragging yourself around. See, I want to be able to serve God with full vitality, with full strength, all of my faculties, you know, working. And here's me, Michael, my problem, I'm assuming that this is what God wants too. <laughs> And then I turn around to pick up a piece of paper on the floor, and then for the next two weeks, I don't do anything. If left alone, we as humans will attempt to go it alone, to become self-sufficient, to depend on nobody. The danger of wealth is that it disconnects you from other people. You can, with your wealth, build a nice wall around yourself so none of the ugly stuff and none of the ugly people can get close to you. But suffering in all of its forms moves us back to where we should be, and that is depending on God for everything. To be dependent on God is not a shameful thing. It's not a sign of weakness. It's an acknowledgement of reality. In reality, we depend on God for every breath we take, but suffering is usually needed to bring that reality into clearer focus for us. 
The greatest waste is when somebody suffers, but their suffering leaves them as self-dependent and proud as ever before. The greatest benefit of suffering one can receive is not getting their health back, or their freedom back, or their happiness back. The greatest benefit of suffering is a new reliance on God each and every day, regardless if the suffering stays or goes. Now no one you know, likes to suffer, suffer trouble and pain, not even Christians. However, Christians don't simply lament over their suffering or pray for relief. They use the experience of suffering as God intends. They allow it to motivate them to change or to reorder their lives. They permit their suffering to open their eyes and hearts to other people who are experiencing similar pain. Christians never lose sight of the fact that sin causes all suffering and Christ is the answer to all sin and ultimately all suffering for everyone. And finally, Christians use suffering as an occasion to draw closer and more dependent on God irregardless of the outcome of their circumstances. And so I asked this morning, so what's your condition? Is your suffering causing you to be angry or to lose hope? I encourage you not to give in to these destructive attitudes in regards to suffering, whatever the cause. For all those who are suffering, the Lord makes this invitation. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Notice, notice he says, you will find rest for your souls. He didn't say, you're going to find a cure, or you will find relief for your physical pain. He said, you will find rest for your souls. The suffering that the pain is causing in your soul. You will find rest for that in Him. Of course, the first step to that end, not to, to, to end not the suffering, but the burden that suffering creates is to come and give that burden to Jesus Christ, who will carry it for you. Peter says it this way, casting all your anxiety upon Him because He cares for you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. So who here needs that? The ones who have the burden of guilt and sin on their hearts, they need to cast them upon the cross of Christ and be baptized to wash away these sins and the, and the guilt and fear that these sins cause forever. And the ones who carry the burden of unfaithfulness and neglect to the church, they also need to cast their burden on that cross and come and be restored through prayer. And the many who are burdened with emotional and physical pain Jesus invites you to come and cast your burden upon Him and allow Him to give you the sweet rest that goes beyond understanding. And when it comes to physical pain, brethren, that thing, the beyond understanding, you know how that works? This is how it works. I don't know how I am doing this, but somehow through Christ I am doing this. That's the thing, that's the way beyond understanding works. I don't know how I got through that, but thanks be to God, He got me through that. I don't know how I could bear being in pain from morning till night for months, for years. I don't know how I did that, but somehow God brought me through that. I don't understand how. Don't look for understanding, brethren. Look for rest. And Jesus promises you rest if you put your burden on Him. If you need to come forward for the prayers of the church or to be baptized or whatever ministry you may need this morning, we encourage you to do so now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.